Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paolo Freire. Read and recorded by Sen Naomi Kirschultz, May 26th, 2022. Chapter 1. While the problem of humanization has always, from an axiological point of view, been humankind's central problem, it now takes on the character of an inescapable concern. Concern for humanization leads at once to the recognition of dehumanization, not only as an ontological possibility, but as a historical reality. And as an individual perceives the extent of dehumanization, he or she may ask if humanization is a viable possibility. Within history, in concrete, objective contexts, both humanization and dehumanization are possibilities for a person as an uncompleted being conscious of their incompletion. But while both humanization and dehumanization are real alternatives, only the first is the people's vocation. This vocation is constantly negated. It is affirmed by that very negation. It is thwarted by injustice, exploitation, oppression, and the violence of the oppressors. And it is affirmed by the yearning of the oppressed for freedom and justice, and by their struggle to recover their lost humanity. Dehumanization which marks not only those whose humanity has been stolen, but also, though in a different way, those who have stolen it, is a distortion of the vocation of becoming more fully human. This distortion occurs within history, but it is not a historical vocation. Indeed, to admit of dehumanization as a historical vocation would lead either to cynicism or total despair. The struggle for humanization for the emancipation of labor, for the overcoming of alienation, for the affirmation of men and women as persons would be meaningless. This struggle is possible only because dehumanization, although a concrete historical fact, is not a given destiny, but the result of an unjust order that engenders violence in the oppressors, which in turn dehumanizes the oppressed. Because it is a distortion of being more fully human, Sooner or later, being less human leads the oppressed to struggle against those who made them so. In order for this struggle to have meaning, the oppressed must not, in seeking to regain their humanity, which is a way to create it, become in turn oppressors of their oppressors, but rather restorers of the humanity of both. This, then, is the great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed, to liberate themselves and their oppressors as well. The oppressors who oppress, exploit, and rape by virtue of their power cannot find in this power the strength to liberate either the oppressed or themselves. Only power that springs from the weakness of the oppressed will be sufficiently strong to free both. Any attempt to soften the power of the oppressor in deference to the weakness of the oppressed almost always manifests itself in the form of false generosity. Indeed, the attempt never goes beyond this. In order to have the continued opportunity to express their quote-unquote generosity, the oppressors must perpetuate injustice as well. An unjust social order is the permanent fount of this quote-unquote generosity, which is nourished by death, despair, and poverty. That is why dispensers of false generosity become desperate at the slightest threat to its source. True generosity consists precisely in fighting to destroy the causes which nourish false charity, False charity constrains the fearful and subdued, the rejects of life, to extend their trembling hands. True generosity lies in striving so that these hands, whether of individuals or entire peoples, need be extended less and less in supplication, so that more and more they become human hands which work and working transform the world. This lesson and this apprenticeship must come, however, from the oppressed themselves and from those who are truly in solidarity with them. As individuals or as peoples, by fighting for the restoration of their humanity, they will be attempting the restoration of true generosity. Who are better prepared than the oppressed to understand the terrible significance of an oppressive society? Who suffers the effect of oppression more than the oppressed? Who can better understand the necessity of liberation? They will not gain this liberation by chance, but through the praxis of their quest for it, through their recognition of the necessity to fight for it. And this fight, because of the purpose given it by the oppressed, 
will actually constitute an act of love opposing the lovelessness which lies at the heart of the oppressor's violence, lovelessness even when clothed in false generosities. But almost always, during the initial stage of the struggle, the oppressed, instead of striving for liberation, tend themselves to become oppressors or sub-oppressors. The very structure of their thought has been conditioned by the contradictions of the concrete existential situation by which they were shaped. Their ideal is to be men, but for them, to be men is to be oppressors. This is their model of humanity. This phenomenon derives from the fact that the oppressed, at a certain moment of their existential experience, adopt an attitude of adhesion to the oppressor. Under these circumstances, they cannot consider, quote-unquote, him sufficiently clearly to objectivize him, to discover him outside of themselves. This does not necessarily mean that the oppressed are unaware that they are downtrodden, but their perception of themselves as oppressed is impaired by their submersion in the reality of oppression. At this level, their perception of themselves as opposites of the oppressor does not yet signify engagement in a struggle to overcome the contradiction. The one pole aspires not to liberation, but to identification with its opposite pole. In this situation, the oppressed do not see the new man as the person to be born from the resolution of this contradiction, as oppression gives way to liberation. For them, the new man or woman themselves becomes the oppressors. Their vision of the new man or woman is individualistic. Because of their identification with the oppressor, they have no consciousness of themselves as persons or as members of an oppressed class. It is not to become free that they want agrarian reform, but in order to acquire land and thus become landowners. Or more precisely, bosses over other workers. It is a rare peasant who, once promoted to overseer, does not become more of a tyrant towards his former comrades than the owner himself. This is because the context of the peasant's situation, that is, oppression, remains unchanged. In this example, the overseer, in order to make sure of his job, must be as tough as the owner, and more so. Thus is illustrated our previous assertion that during the initial stage of their struggle, the oppressed find in the oppressor their model of manhood. <clears throat> Even revolution, which transforms a concrete situation of oppression by establishing the process of liberation, must confront this phenomenon. Many of the oppressed who directly or indirectly participate in revolution intend, conditioned by the myths of the old order, to make it their private revolution. The shadow of their former oppressor is still cast over them. The quote-unquote fear of freedom which afflicts the oppressed, a fear which may equally well lead them to desire the role of oppressor or bind them to the role of oppressed, should be examined. One of the basic elements of the relationship between oppressor and oppressed is prescription. Every prescription represents the imposition of one individual's choice upon another, transforming the consciousness of the person prescribed to into one that conforms with the prescriber's consciousness. Thus, the behavior of the oppressed is a prescribed behavior, following as it does the guidelines of the oppressor. The oppressed, having internalized the image of the oppressor and adopted his guidelines, are fearful of freedom. Freedom would require them to eject this image and replace it with autonomy and responsibility. Freedom is acquired by conquest, not by gift. It must be pursued constantly and responsibly. Freedom is not an ideal located outside of man, nor is it an idea which becomes myth. It is rather the indispensable condition for the quest for human completion. To surmount the situation of oppression, people must first critically recognize its causes so that through transforming action they can create a new situation, one which makes possible the pursuit of a fuller humanity. But the struggle to be more fully human has already begun in the authentic struggle to transform the situation. Although the situation of oppression is a dehumanized and dehumanizing totality affecting both oppressors and those whom they oppress, it is the latter who must, from their stifled humanity, wage for both the struggle for a fuller humanity. The oppressor, who is himself dehumanized because he dehumanizes others, is unable to lead this struggle. <clears throat> However, the oppressed, who have adapted to the structure of domination in which they are immersed and have become resigned to it 
are inhibited from waging the struggle for freedom so long as they feel incapable of running the risks it requires. Moreover, their struggle for freedom threatens not only the oppressor but also their own oppressed comrades who are fearful of still greater repression. When they discover within themselves the yearning to be free, they perceive that this yearning can be transformed into reality only when the same yearning is aroused in their comrades. But while dominated by the fear of freedom, they refuse to appeal to others, or to listen to the appeals of others, or even to the appeals of their own conscience. They prefer gregariousness to authentic comradeship. They prefer the security of conformity with their state of unfreedom to the creative communion produced by freedom and even the very pursuit of freedom. The oppressed suffer from the duality which has established itself in their innermost beings. They discover that without freedom they cannot exist authentically. Yet, although they desire authentic existence, they fear it. They are at one and the same time themselves and the oppressor whose consciousness they have internalized. The conflict lies in the choice between being wholly themselves or being divided, between ejecting the oppressor within or not ejecting them, between human solidarity or alienation, between following prescriptions or having choices, between being spectators or actors, between acting or having the illusion of acting through the action of the oppressors, between speaking out or being silent, castrated in their power to create and recreate in their power to transform the world. This is the tragic dilemma of the oppressed, which their education must take into account. This book will present some aspects of what the writer has termed the pedagogy of the oppressed, a pedagogy which must be forged with, not for, the oppressed, whether individuals or peoples, in the incessant struggle to regain their humanity. This pedagogy makes oppression and its causes objects of reflection, by the oppressed, and from that reflection will come their necessary engagement in the struggle for their liberation. And in the struggle, this pedagogy will be made and remade. The central problem is this. How can the oppressed, as divided, unauthentic beings, participate in developing the pedagogy of their liberation? Only as they discover themselves to be the quote-unquote hosts of the oppressor can they contribute to the midwifery of their liberating pedagogy. As long as they live in the duality of which to be is to be like, and to be like is to be like the oppressor, this contribution is impossible. The pedagogy of the oppressed is an instrument for their critical discovery that both they and their oppressors are manifestations of dehumanization. Liberation is thus a childbirth and a painful one. The man or woman who emerges is a new person viable only as the oppressor-oppressed contradiction is superseded by the humanization of all a people. Or, to put it another way, the solution of this contradiction is born in the labor which brings into the world this new being, no longer oppressor, no longer oppressed, but human, in the process of achieving freedom. This solution cannot be achieved in idealistic terms. In order for the oppressed to be able to wage the struggle for their liberation, they must perceive the reality of oppression not as a closed world from which there is no exit, but as a limiting situation which they can transform. This perception is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for liberation. It must become the motivating force for liberating action. Nor does the discovery by the oppressed that they exist in dialectical relationship to the oppressor as his antithesis that is, without them, the oppressor could not exist, in itself constitute liberation. The oppressed can overcome the contradiction in which they are caught only when this perception enlists them in the struggle to free themselves. The same is true with respect to the individual oppressor as a person. Discovering himself to be an oppressor may cause considerable anguish, but it does not necessarily lead to solidarity with the oppressed. Rationalizing his guilt through paternalistic treatment of the oppressed, all the while holding them fast in a position of dependence, will not do. Solidarity requires that one enter into the situation of those with whom one is in solidarity. It is a radical posture. If what characterizes the oppressed is their subordination to the consciousness of the master, as Hegel affirms, 
True solidarity with the oppressed means fighting at their side to transform the objective reality which has made them these beings for another. The oppressor is solidary with the oppressed only when he stops regarding the oppressed as an abstract category and sees them as persons who have been unjustly dealt with, deprived of their voice, cheated in the sale of their labor, when he stops making pious, sentimental, and individualistic gestures and risks an act of love. True solidarity is found only in the plenitude of this act of love in its existentiality and its praxis. To affirm that men and women are persons and as persons should be free and yet to do nothing tangible to make this affirmation a reality is a farce. Since it is a concrete situation that the oppressor-oppressed contradiction is established, the resolution of this contradiction must be objectively verifiable. Hence, the radical requirement, both for the individual who discovers himself or herself to be an oppressor and for the oppressed, that the concrete situation which begets oppression must be transformed. To present this radical demand for the objective transformation of reality, to combat subjectivist immobility, which would divert the recognition of oppression into patient waiting for oppression to disappear by itself, is not to dismiss the role of subjectivity in the struggle to change structures. On the contrary, one cannot conceive of objectivity without subjectivity. Neither can exist without the other, nor can they be dichotomized. The separation of objectivity from subjectivity, the denial of the latter when analyzing reality or acting upon it, is objectivism. On the other hand, the denial of objectivity in analysis or action, resulting in a subjectivism which leads to solipsistic positions, denies action itself by denying objective reality. Neither objectivism nor subjectivism, nor yet psychologism, is propounded here, but rather subjectivity and objectivity in constant dialectical relationship. To deny the importance of subjectivity in the process of transforming the world and history is naive and simplistic, it is to admit the impossible, a world without people. This objectivistic position is as ingenuous as that of subjectivism, which postulates that people without a world. World and human beings do not exist apart from each other, they exist in constant interaction. Marx does not expose such a dichotomy nor does any other critical, realistic thinker. What Marx criticized and scientifically destroyed was not subjectivity, but subjectivism and psychologism, just as objective social reality ex exists not by chance, but as the product of human action, so it is not transformed by chance. If humankind produces a social reality, which is the inversion of the praxis, turns back upon them and conditions them, then... Transforming that reality is a historical task, a task for humanity. Reality, which becomes oppressive, results in the contradistinction of men as oppressors and oppressed. The latter, whose task it is to struggle for their liberation together with those who show true solidarity, must acquire a critical awareness of oppression through the practice of this struggle. One of the gravest obstacles to those achievements of liberation is that oppressive reality absorbs those within it, and thereby acts to submerge human beings' consciousness. Functionally, oppression is domesticating. To no longer be prey to its force, one must emerge from it and turn upon it. This can be done only by means of the praxis, reflection and action upon the world in order to transform it. <coughs> Hay que hacer al opresión real todavía más opresiva, Anandiendo a aquella a la conciencia de la opresión haciendo la infamia todavía más infamante al pregonarla. Making real oppression more oppressive still by adding to it the realization of oppression corresponds to the dialectical relation between an subjective and the objective. Only in this interdependence is the authentic praxis possible, without which it is impossible to resolve the oppressor-oppressed contradiction. To achieve this goal, the oppressed must confront reality critically, simultaneously objectifying and acting upon that reality. A mere perception of reality not followed by this critical intervention will not lead to a transformation of objective reality, precisely because it is not a true perception. 
This is the case of a purely subjectivist perception by someone who forsakes objective reality and creates a false substitute. A different type of false perception occurs when a change in objective reality would threaten the individual or class interests of the perceiver. In the first instance, there is no critical intervention in reality because that reality is fictitious. There is none in the second instance because the intervention would contradict the class interests of the perceiver. In the latter case, the tendency of the perceiver is to behave neurotically. The fact exists, but both the fact and what may result from it may be prejudicial to the person. Thus, it becomes necessary, but not precisely to deny the fact, but to see it differently, quote-unquote. This rationalization as a defense mechanism coincides in the end with subjectivism, a fact which is not denied but whose truths are rationalized loses its objective base. It ceases to be concrete and becomes a myth created in defense of the class of the perceiver. Herein lies one of those reasons for the prohibitions and the difficulties to be discussed at length in chapter 4, designed to dissuade the people from critical interventions in reality. The oppressor knows full well that this intervention would not be to his interest. What is to his interest is for the people to continue in a state of submersion, impotent in the face of oppressive reality. Of relevance here is Lukács' warning to the Revolutionary Party. Il doit, pour employer le mot de marche, expliquer au masse le propre action, non seulement afin de assurer la continuité des expériences révolutionnaires du prolétariat, mais aussi d'activer consciemment le développement ultérieur de ces expériences. <coughs> In affirming this necessity, Lukacs is unquestionably posing the problem of critical intervention. To explain to the masses their own action is to clarify and illuminate that action, both regarding its relationship to the objective facts by which it was prompted and regarding its purposes. The more the people unveil this challenging reality, which is to be the object of their transforming action, the more critically they enter into that reality. In this way, they are consciously activating the subsequent development of their experiences. There would be no human action if there were no objective reality, no world to be the not-I of the person and to challenge them, just as there would be no human action if humankind were not a quote-unquote project. If he or she were not able to transcend himself or herself, if one were not able to perceive reality and understand it in order to transform it. In dialectical thought, world and action are intimately interdependent, but action is human only when it is not merely an occupation, but also a preoccupation, that is, when it is not dichotomized from reflection. Reflection, which is essential to action, is implicit in Lukács' requirement of explaining to the masses their own action, <clears throat> just as it is implicit in the purpose he attributes to this explanation, that of consciously activating the subsequent development of experience. For us, however, the requirement is seen not in terms of explaining to, but rather dialoguing with the people about their actions. In any event, no reality transforms itself, and the duty which Lukács ascribes to the revolutionary party of explaining to the masses their own action coincides with our affirmation of the need for the critical intervention of the people in reality through the praxis. The pedagogy of the oppressed, which is the pedagogy of people engaged in the fight for their own liberation, has its roots here, and those who recognize or begin to recognize themselves as oppressed must be among the developers of this pedagogy. No pedagogy which is truly liberating can remain distant from the oppressed by treating them as unfortunates and presenting for their emulation models from among the oppressors. The oppressed must be their own example in the struggle for their redemption. The pedagogy of the oppressed, animated by authentic humanist, not humanitarian generosity, presents itself as a pedagogy of humankind. Pedagogy which begins with the egoistic interests of the oppressors, an egoism cloaked in the false generosity of paternalism, and makes of the oppressed the objects of its humanitarianism, itself maintains and embodies oppression. It is an instrument of dehumanization. This is why, as we affirmed earlier, the pedagogy of the oppressed cannot be developed or practiced by the oppressors.
it would be a contradiction in terms if the oppressor is not only defended but actually implemented a liberating education. But if the implementation of a liberating education requires political power and the oppressed have none, how then is it possible to carry out the pedagogy of the oppressed prior to the revolution? This is a question of the greatest importance, the reply to which is at least tentatively outlined in chapter 4. One aspect of the reply is to be found in the distinction between systematic education, which can be only changed by political power, and educational projects, which should be carried out with the oppressed in the process of organizing them. The pedagogy of the oppressed as a humanist and libertarian pedagogy has two distinct stages. In the first, the oppressed unveil the world of oppression and through the praxis commit themselves to its transformation. In the second stage, in which the reality of the oppression has already been transformed, this pedagogy ceases to belong to the oppressed and becomes a pedagogy of all people in the process of permanent liberation. In both stages, it is always through action in depth that the culture of domination is culturally confronted. In the first stage, this confrontation occurs through the change in the way the oppressed perceive the world of opposition and oppression. In the second stage, through the expulsion of the myths created and developed in the old order, which like specters haunt the new structure emerging from the revolutionary transformation. The pedagogy of the first stage must deal with the problem of the oppressed consciousness and the oppressor consciousness, the problem of men and women who oppress and men and women who suffer oppression. It must take into account their behavior, their view of the world, and their ethics. A particular problem is the duality of the oppressed, they are contradictory, divided beings shaped by an existing and a concrete situation of oppression and violence. Any situation in which A objectively exploits B or hinders his and her pursuit of self-affirmation as a responsible person is one of oppression. Such a situation in itself constitutes violence, even when sweetened by false generosities because it interferes with the individual's ontological and historical vocation to be more fully human. With the establishment of a relationship of oppression, violence has already begun. Never in history has violence been initiated by the oppressed. How could they be the initiators if they themselves are the result of violence? How could they be the sponsors of something whose objective inauguration called forth their existence as oppressed? There would be no oppressed had there been no prior situation of violence to establish their subjugation. Violence is initiated by those who oppress, who exploit, who fail to recognize others as persons, not by those who are oppressed, exploited, and unrecognized. It is not the unloved who initiate disaffection, but those who cannot love because they love only themselves. It is not the helpless, subject to terror, who initiate terror, but the violent, who with their power create the concrete situation which begets the rejects of life. It is not the tyrannized who initiate despotism, but the tyrants. It is not the despised who initiate hatred, but those who despise. It is not those who humanity is denied them who negate humankind, but those who denied that humanity, thus negating their own as well. Force is used not by those who have become weak under the preponderance of the strong, but by the strong who have emasculated them. For the oppressors, however, it is always the oppressed, whom they obviously never call the oppressed, depending on whether they are fellow countrymen or not, those people, or the blind and envious masses, or savages, or natives, or subversives, who are disaffected, who are violent, barbaric, wicked, or ferocious when they react to the violence of the oppressors. Yet it is, paradoxical though it may seem, precisely in the response of the oppressed to the violence of the oppressors that a gesture of love may be found, consciously or unconsciously, the act of rebellion by the oppressed, an act which is always or nearly always as violent as the initial violence of the oppressors, can initiate love. Whereas the violence of the oppressors prevents the oppressed from being fully human, the response of the latter to this violence is grounded in the desire to pursue the right to be human. As the oppressors dehumanize others and violate their rights, they themselves also become dehumanized. As the oppressed fighting to be human take away the oppressor's power to dominate and suppress, they restore to the oppressors the humanity they had lost in their exercise of oppression.
This has been part one of the first chapter of Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Feiri, read by San Naomi Kirschultz.